Hello. Hello. I'm Alex. I'm Val. And we're going to talk about Sopranos. Season 3, episode 5, another toothpick. Yeah. Usually you try to say that in tandem with me when... When another you, toothpick. Uh, another toothpick. <laughs> another toothpick. Good. <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I always forget how good season three is. It's pretty incredible. And this kind of like trilogy of episodes. So we have Employee of the Month, then we have this Another Toothpick, and next week we have University. Yeah. So it's just a pretty insane trilogy of episodes I would say and I don't know like I'm you know I'm curious to kind of evaluate at the end of this season kind of the overall season arc but it's almost like we have the first two episodes acting together right and they were shown together mm-hmm. then you know then we have fortunate son right so we kind of like are introduced to the stuff of this season a little bit in that episode but then we have employee of the month right so I just feel like I don't know. There, it, well, it's just like ramping up so fast. Well, it's almost episodes. like a return to the first season in that there's these like combinations of episodes within the season yeah. that happen at unpredictable times, which is something that they definitely did yeah. in the first season. And I think something that ties at least the last episode, Employee of the Month, this episode, and also the next episode coming up, University, is that like they're kind of raising the stakes of violence mm-hmm. on the show and impact of what is happening. Like it becomes a little bit more real. Like we're confronted more with the realities of what happens in this world. Yeah. And how violent it is. I think Well, I think it's a turn for the season for the series, rather. Yeah. Like, you know, we were dealing with other issues in season one and season two, and now it's really showing us, like it's showing us how it's like unavoidable for these characters to live this kind of violent, terrible existence, right? Yeah. Um, and we see that with like the characters' psyches as well, changing over the course of the seasons, that there's something different going on here, right? Like in this episode, even alone, we could talk about, you know, like how Junior has changed now, yeah. you know, since the beginning of this season. Um, we see Tony kind of grappling with death in these different ways. We see Tony and Jan. We see Janice being this completely different character. So we really see this shift, and like, it would be hard for us to come back from it, right? Like, I don't know if it's a, uh, it's not just a momentary shift. There's something very deep happening to these characters. We see it with Carmela in this episode yeah. too, in in that scene with in that first scene in Melfi's office. I yeah. mean, we see this huge shift for these characters and. I don't know. I think it's like I think it's a big. This is a big point in the series uh, yeah. as a whole, if I, not the season, if not yeah. just you know. I feel episode. like there's like a continued dwelling on these existential crises that yeah. the characters are all going through, and they are all dealing with death. And I think that yeah. that's a really pivotal part of this episode totally. in particular. I think that they're confronted with death for multiple characters, and different characters are dealing with it in different ways, but none of them are particularly. <laughs> None of them are really dealing with it in a positive manner. No, no. And we'll definitely, like, that's definitely something we'll want to talk about this episode. Yeah. Um, For sure. What else do you, how do you want to kind of, like, do this one today? Well, for me, I have kind of, like, a couple main areas of focus within the episode. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's kind of the arc that happens with Leon Wilmore, the mm-hmm. traffic cop. Mm-hmm who ends up working at Fountains of Wayne. (laughs) And then we also have kind of, for me, the focus on death and this idea of things happening in threes and characters dealing with that. Yeah. Um, No, that's, I love that one. That's an interesting one for me. There's there's different like narratives that are happening in the episode, you know, particularly between Artie and Adriana and, and some others. But for me, those were kind of the two main areas where I was finding a lot of commonalities and, and yeah. ideas kind of popping no, up. No, for sure. Yeah, I had a few different things, like more like questions about yeah. characters' motivations in some of these mm-hmm. scenes. Um, also, just the fact that like we're introduced to like a bunch of new characters in this episode that then we we don't ever see again. But we have the like these characters come in for a reason, right? They yeah. they serve a specific purpose. So I kind of wanted to touch on some of that. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, kind of just some big questions about um, what death means to these characters. Kind of like you, like what 
what it all means to them. Mm -hmm. And the religion, like the religion aspect, I think is part Mm -hmm. of it too. Yeah. So, yeah. Definitely. It's a lot. So, yeah. Start somewhere. (laughs) I did just want to talk about, I know it's like, it is a little bit standalone. I did just want to talk about that scene at the beginning with Carmela and Tony and Melfi. Definitely. Um, Because, and like, there's at so many different points in this episode, like you kind of expect characters to act a certain way and then they surprise you a little bit. Yeah. So here, of course, like, we don't even know. Well, this, uh, first of all, this is Terrence Winter who's writing this episode. Yeah. So um, he, I don't know, like, at least in my memory of his other episodes that come later on, it's only his third one so far mm-hmm. in, this, in the series. But from the ones that come later on, he really plays with kind of these, like, overlapping character story arcs. Like, he, he has a lot of arcs that are reflective of each other within episodes. Um so, I don't know. I was just paying attention to that. Um, but we have this amazing... And who was the director? The director was Jack Bender. Do we know Do we I know believe him? this... I might be wrong, but I think this is his first episode that he's directed. Okay. This year. He, he's not... We haven't seen him that much. There's we, some and we don't interesting see camera stuff here. Like, and hope, yeah. know, we'll point some of that out. But we have that really disorienting shot at the beginning of the episode. Well, I feel, yeah. That's definitely very deliberate. Yeah. Well, we have... Like, we can't see Carmela, basically. Um, in the office, we just see Tony and Melfi, and, and we see like... Tony independently, and then we see Melfi, which is actually like at this point almost like a trope for the show. Totally. Like it's so established, they have that. like no motion in the cameras. We see the characters; we're focused on their face. Tony is communicating things through the way that his face is responding to mm-hmm. the situation. We see Melfi. It's a very standard situation for the show. But then the camera moves, mm-hmm. and the, which never happens in mm-hmm. in the in the uh, office in Melfi's in Melfi's yeah. office and actually when I'm watching it it almost makes me feel at first before you see that Carmel is there that it could even be a dream like there's an aspect of surrealism well or like something. kind of of like you know Christopher floating through Satrials like it yeah. has that kind of I mean vibe. they've yeah. they've established a precedent for how they film those scenes and they yeah. just completely break it down yeah no, it's really, it's really, it's really bizarre. It's so, really disorienting. Yeah, and, and I think and Carmela then, there is also disorienting, being in that sure. space where you know they grapple with the psychological, you know, aspects of Tony's life. Yeah. And, well, but we're also kind of like again, like we're surprised to see her there, but then we're also surprised by her reaction, right? Mm-hmm. Like we have her at first saying like, if you had, you know, if you had asked me five years ago. Or if you had told me five years ago that I'd be here today, like yeah. she kind of like comes across as um, into it, you know, like or happy to be there. But then we really see her turn, right? Like oh, she... interesting. That was your. That's how you interpreted that. Well, that I mean, she like... was like five years ago, she would have wanted to be doing couples therapy. I think so. Interesting. I almost interpreted it the other way, almost the like complete opposite. Oh. But I think that's a fair no, reading. No, it's kind of like a like it's a, like. Yeah, that's my reading of it. See, for me, like, even when she said she was crying in the car, and then Tony says, oh, and you say, I'm the one who doesn't communicate, and then she does communicate, and she says, it's just sad that I feel like we have to pay somebody to, like, tell us how we should interact with each other. I think that she is glad earlier on in the series that Tony is going to therapy, but at this point, for them to be going to couples therapy, that is admitting that there's a problem. Mm. And I think that from their generation, there's a stigma against oh, psychotherapy. Interesting. And it, she's having a hard time dealing with it. For me, I personally, I don't know, I just interpret it in the moment as if you told me five years ago, I would have never thought that we would be at a point in our relationship where we would need therapy because there's like a weird uh, stigma about see, it. I don't know. Yeah, I don't because I think like it's um, like five years ago, things were obviously not good for them either. Yeah. Like so I for me, it's like she's surprised that Tony finally would have like invited her to this. Yeah. And, you know, I so I don't anyways, I think it's but I think it's left purposely vague because I think like as I said, like I think like it does kind of it's a questionable statement, I guess. Mm-hmm. But then we have her saying, like, you know, like, it's this is your problem, Tony. Like, you stick your dick into anything you And maybe find. you pass out because you're guilty of something. Yeah. I thought that was a really and key so line. And so it's this, like, whatever. And you can see, you know, her anger when Tony um, says to Melfi, like, I dumped that Russian person months ago right yeah. and he turns to melfi and we see yeah. carmel look at melfi like 
you know, that she knew about this stuff yeah. going on. And yet she seems to be, and I, I, you know what, I am on team Carmela with this. Yeah. Like she does seem to be placing a lot of blame onto Carmela. Mm-hmm. Right. So I don't blame Carm for feeling ganged up on in that situation. That was pretty. I mean, right. Tony was being a dickhole. And <laughs> what else is new? And, you know, especially <laughs> when he's like, yeah, I love you, too. Like mm-hmm. just being a total ass. Yeah. So I don't blame her. But yeah, like they but they don't need anyone to teach them to communicate. Right. Like. Well, none of them are none of the characters in this show the show really issue. are willing to deal with take responsibility for their actions. Mm-hmm. And actually, it reminds me of in this episode, there is a scene where, I mean, Artie has some had some difficulties in this episode, but when he's talking to Charmaine and uh, she says to him, when are you going to learn? Be happy within thine own self. Yeah. Which I think is kind of like a key point in this show that a lot of these characters are not comfortable in themselves. Yeah. And they don't accept responsibility for their faults. And they're always searching for something. They're willing to be assholes and be narcissists and really, like, create havoc around them to, like, achieve these things that are not really that important. Yeah. Even, like, that scene, I thought it was important. Like, she says that, when are you going to, you know, be happy within thine own self? And then the edit is straight to, like, all the key players of the mob. And that's, like, Tony, Ralphie, Gigi, Polly, Johnny Sack is there. Right. And I think that, like, all these characters do share something of they're not happy within themselves. Right. And I think that Tony does not accept responsibility for what he's done. And that probably, Carmel's probably right in the therapy session. Yeah. Where she says, maybe you pass out because you're guilty of something. Yeah. But Carmela hasn't ex- accepted responsibility for what she's done either, right? No, I don't think so anybody again, has. So, again, yeah. like, we're tricked, like into like when you know when the cop does pull them over yeah right and we see carmela sitting in the background of tony who's like pulling out all the stops like yeah for me that would be very embarrassing right to be with someone and so you see carmela's face and she's very like stone faced she's looking straight ahead Mm -hmm. and we think that when she speaks like afterwards she's gonna be mad because she told him to slow down right she told him like you're driving like a crazy person or whatever um, but then she turns and says that thing, like, our tax dollars at work, like, yeah. you'd, you'd think they'd be out arresting dope dealers. Dope dealers, yeah. Or whatever, right? And so we're like, oh, like, that's not what I expected her to say, right? Like, she's yeah. on Team Tony there. Yeah. You know? I know. And... And also the hypocrisy. Like, well, I mean, totally. this, like, morality over taxes and yeah. the way that it's spent when they're, like, constantly well, manipulating and... the system to benefit and profit from yeah. it. Yeah. No, totally. But it's but it's interesting there, like, just kind of, you know, like you said, like, this being, like, being, not being happy within my own self necessarily, but, like, just being, like... Yeah, having, like, the confidence to just be yourself, right? And, like, take ownership of who you are. Yeah, and know your faults. Yeah. And to to know your strengths and to, you know, live accordingly. Also, yeah, like, that idea of Carmel, I think that that's linked to what Carmela said, you know, maybe you you pass out because you're guilty of something. Mm. And we have this situation immediately after where they're in the car. Tony is not dealing with their, you know, their talk about how it went well. And he starts speeding up. Like, he he turns it Mm -hmm. into escalating it into something that's dangerous for them and even says maybe we'll die yeah i mean and like the way that they're using sound effects in the background outside the car like it's clear that he's wreck he's driving really really recklessly and it's creating a lot of tension in the scene because there's this like imminent danger of him acting out like this and then (laughs) when he gets pulled over by a cop he says it's a fucking speed trap yeah which is so ridiculous because clearly the problem here is this it's is a, a direct example of what she was just saying. Yeah. He just went crazy with speeding, and now he's blaming it on, oh, it's the f- it's the fact that trip. it's a speed trap. That's the problem. Yeah. So that, I mean, that introduces this really interesting character, Wilmore, though, because he's kind of the opposite of that. Right. You know, he does kind of play by the rules, and he is kind of like a straight shooter. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what happens when a character like Tony Soprano is confronted with somebody with a strong moral code mm-hmm. and I think that's something that's examined really deeply in this episode mm-hmm. and that's a really important part of what's happening in, in this one yeah it's interesting like I, I know you have more to say about that so I'll let you say it too but the one thing that's interesting about that because I think like I'm on the same page with you for the most part mm-hmm. and I'll see what you have to say I guess but 
The one really interesting one is in Tony's call to Zelman when he's talking about how like you know the guy was fired or whatever like at, at that point Tony's kind of trying to get his job back like yeah. he felt like it was a little bit too harsh or whatever mm-hmm. and he says like oh no like the guy's co-workers complain about him all the time like he, the guy is a goddamn rabble rouser yeah <laughs> Um, he says he's like depressed or something like that. Like there's a couple things he says about him there. Um, yeah. So that's what's kind of throwing me off actually, because my my recollection of him was this like very moral. Okay, I thought that person. was a really interesting yeah. part for yeah. me when Zellman is saying the guy is a goddamn rabble rouser yeah. and talking about these things. For me, it's like there's a frame of reference and a perspective that comes from characters like Tony and Zellman, who are these bottom feeders, mm. that when somebody comes along with like a spine and like some kind of like moral backbone for them that's a rabble rouser because it's like getting in their way of like wreaking havoc right it's almost like when like a credit card company calls somebody who pays all of their cards on time a deadbeat (laughs) for me it's almost exactly like that because for me like everything that we've been presented about this character except for what zelman says shows that he actually does have principles Mm -hmm. in a way that's super rare on this show Mm -hmm. it almost never happens Mm -hmm. in fact somebody to turn down bribes multiple times even at the end of the episode tony's offering him two hundred dollars and he walks away things like that don't happen in this show yeah because characters and humans and the people in Sopranos always choose the easy thing that benefits them right away and he never does that so for me that's a rabble rouser yeah. because it fucks with their ability to manipulate situations and constantly benefit themselves. No, you're right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think for me, that's what it was. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Uh, even, you know, like <laughs> there was some irony in, in Zellman talking about um, earlier on in the episode, talking to Tony the first time, I think, about the traffic situation. And Zellman calls it a deplorable situation. I'll straighten it out. (laughs) It's interesting that, I mean, we get to see the lengths that Tony will go through over, you know, a traffic ticket, Mm -hmm. which is clearly so ridiculous because he clearly has the means to pay for it. It's about something else. It's about control. Yeah. And it's about dominance. Yeah. It's It's, about who's in charge. Yeah. And it's about like being this like untouchable kingpin or something Mm -hmm. who's above the law. I mean, when I was thinking about it, I was, I was thinking it's almost ridiculous that this character would like head on confront law enforcement with somebody who has so much to lose from the law coming after him but he's so confident about it and it's about this level of control that he does and he has no problem with a game of chicken like he's like just going right at this guy and like throwing everything at him yeah um and like he could have called backup cops and brought tony to jail then that you know like with his pending court cases or whatever right like that becomes an issue. Like he does have a lot at risk. Yeah. To do that, but he can't help it. Like that's he has to dominate. Yeah. You know. Which is interesting for me that Zelman calls it a deplorable situation oh, yeah. because clearly the deplorable one is Tony. Mm-hmm. And yet Tony is going after this guy, and and you know, and we see characters within the orbit of Tony Soprano seeing him in this twisted way as the deplorable one, and what he did was deplorable when clearly that's like inverse logic Mm -hmm. it's like the it's the complete opposite of the reality Mm -hmm. yeah what do you think about the shots with the fountains well i think everybody should go to soprano's autopsy and i think that they should read the write-up on this episode Mm -hmm. i think um he does a great job as always and he has one you know idea in particular which you know i just have to credit him Mm because i I think he's i think he's pretty dead on Mm -hmm. um he was talking about um, so, okay, so when he's talking about the fountains, the scenes with Wilmore, the idea that... At Fountains of Wayne. Yeah, at, at the fountain store. The idea that, like, when he's when he's surrounded by these stone fountains, that they are these immovable objects. Mm. They don't kind of, like, blend. Uh, they don't kind of bend in the wind. And that the idea that Wilmore's, like, fixed morality, mm-hmm. the fact that it's not flexible like a lot of the other characters in this show... Is different and Tony doesn't have a way to respond to that. That it right. kind of like makes him naked, it makes him powerless. Right. Because his strength comes from manipulating the flexible morality of others. Yeah. But he can't with this guy. And so even though in the end of the show, we Wilmore see Tony has been standing there like a big statue with the fountain. Yeah. Well, and I mean Wilmore has been 
kind of like reduced to this like pitiful state and mm -hmm. it's really sad he's been sent to you know the basement or whatever mm -hmm. like in the wire the property unit or yeah. whatever <laughs> yeah but um he can't do overtime he's working this second job and that's not fair like the sense of justice is horrible mm -hmm. i mean in the show the idea that in in one sense the people who don't play by the rules and wreak havoc on others is are the ones who always win and come out ahead is awful. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's something that Wilmore has that Tony doesn't in the end of the episode. Right. And I think that his fixed morality is seen, could be seen by us and is seen maybe by the people who created the show as like something that's very powerful as well. Right. And important and something that we should kind of, you know, look up to and, and recognize. Yeah. Because without people like that... Where, I mean, the, where this, would we yeah. be? Yeah. 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 And even the characters we want to think have some of that, they don't like a Carmella or something like that, right? Well, Carmella's like, complicated. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, she definitely doesn't But she's have... not unbendable. Definitely in, you not. You know, like a, no. like a fountain. No. Even but, actually in Soprano's Autopsy, he references, you know, the name Will more. Like the fact that he has more Will than, right. than Tony. Right, right, right. And actually it's funny. I mean, in this show, sometimes names and song lyrics actually are like, so literal over the top like, yeah like over yeah. the top literal like i feel yeah. like that actually i i agree with mm -hmm. i think that that's an example of like them using words in their like most basic sense to communicate something yeah yeah no it's definitely interesting and again he's one of these characters one of these many characters that we only kind of meet in this episode and then yeah. don't that's meet it. again yeah right um, the other one being kind of, I guess I can consider like a duo of uh, Bobby Sr., Bobby Bacala Sr. And Mustang and Sal. And Mustang Sal, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, it's, I mean, this is, so this is why I think like this was the thing that kind of stood out to me as really Terrence Wintry. Mm -hmm. We get this scene, right? So it's like the third scene in, like it's after Carmela and Tony get the ticket. I think, mm -hmm. and we have this girl at a fight with this guy who we we don't know any of them. No. They're yelling at each other. There's this other guy. We do see Spadafore construction on the van, yes. so we can recognize that yes. there's, I mean, you can recognize that there's a connection to Vito Spadafore if you watch this show a lot. A million times, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Otherwise, you maybe could. you wouldn't notice that. Yeah, so you have this scene, and then you have this, like, brutal violence, right? Like, yeah. this is not even a character you know. Yeah. But it's this, like, really shocking scene. And only after, when we see them at the hospital, do we find out that this is the younger brother of Vito Spadafore, yeah. who's part of Gigi's right. crew, yeah. right? So we start to, like, see that crew and how they interact. But um, we get someone else who, like, has a different sense of, like, right and wrong and morality and someone who's grappling with their own mortality with Bobby Bacala Sr. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if we want to talk about the death stuff or talk about them, but I just like how there's these kind of two characters in this episode and they both kind of teach us different things and then they're gone. Yeah. You know, um, we, we have them. Yeah. Only for this episode. So I don't know. They, yeah, that, again, so the way that they play with me. form and like these yeah. kind of like short stories within, yeah. you know, the entire show. I mean, because it's gutsy to bring in new characters. I mean, it can obviously be a cheap device, but... The show but is never cheap. It works here. Like, it works, and they have yeah. these, like, almost standalone episodes, but mm -hmm. then they're constantly playing with it. So some truly are standalone episodes. Mm -hmm. Some are contained in terms of the this world that they build. pretty contained. In a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, things are developing, and that's kind of the revolutionary thing about this show is that they played with structure in a way where they would have kind of, like, independent episodes, but at the same time, they'll push forward the larger narrative of the entire mm -hmm. series within them. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one thing in this episode that, like, for me, makes it a little bit confusing, and that's why I mm -hmm. feel like it, it is kind of this standalone episode, is the stuff with Artie and Adriana. Mm -hmm. Because that seems to come out of absolutely nowhere. Like, I don't know. I could go back and, like, examine it. But, like, when yeah. when did Artie fall in love with Adriana? It, coming up, you know, about the threes, right? We, yeah. we have a mention here, like, she's been working there for three years. Right. Oh, um, really? I missed that one. And there's another one, sorry, in the T Carmela and Melfi and Tony session. Um, 
they talk about that he's been coming there for three years. There's, and we'll talk about the threes later. Right. But anyways, I just, yeah. just, so anyways, Adrian's working there somehow for three years also. Mm-hmm. And Artie is. It's also season three. I mean, there's a lot of threes in this episode wow. we can get into. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but like Artie is like suddenly in love with her and he says that to Tony. Like it just yeah. seems really extreme. Um, and I don't know if, do we like come back to this? I don't know. Like, is it a recurring thing? <laughs> Let's wait and find I, out. I feel like it might just be in this episode, <laughs> largely. <laughs> largely, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, anyway, so that's the thing about that that kind of threw me off. But at the same time, I I like it. Mm-hmm. Because I think, like, Artie is struggling more and more with his relationship um, with someone, with, with Charmaine, who's... Who's quite moral. Yeah, right? and I think she's an example. She's one of the few examples of another character who yeah. does have that kind of like unbendable moral spirit. Yeah. And yeah, she's constantly standing up for the right thing, the hard thing, and mm-hmm. the thing that actually, yeah. And so that's becoming harder and harder for Artie, right? Yeah. Like at the beginning, he wasn't as tempted into some, like, you know, getting money from Tony or working with Tony, yeah. right? Like he could kind of see that side, but then things kind of got fucked up for him. Yeah. Like when he found out that Tony, you know, was responsible for the bombing of Vesuvio or whatever, yeah. you know? So, and with And yet Olivia. he's still drawn, you know, to well, Tony. Well, that, but I think that's the thing. Like, I think like it didn't change the fact that he's drawn to it. It just changed his relationship with morality that like maybe he lives in a world where they're, they're where being moral doesn't get you far, right? And so, right. you know, Tony, well, he's and recognizing Tony, you know, that because like, that's the truth yeah. in the show and, you know, potentially yeah. the real world. Yeah. That, so, but, yeah. you know, but if that's how you're feeling, right? Like he's coming kind of like to grips with what he would need to do to be as successful as these guys who we all see sitting in his restaurant night after night. Yeah. Or who have girlfriends like Adriana. Um, he needs to, um, he, he can't be, okay. I, I don't know how to say it. Like he is changing. Yeah. And that makes it harder and harder to deal with someone who is like Charmaine, who is this kind of moral compass and guide. Um, And we see him also in some ways, too, like dealing with his own mortality. Morality and mortality are two hard words to keep (laughs) saying again and again, but I'll try to do my best. Um, His own mortality kind of as this like balding, there's like mentions of him being bald in this episode, right? Like he gets his ear pierced. Yeah. Um, so he's like kind of also having this like midlife crisis of some sort. Definitely. Um, which is different than the way that, you know, these, these old timers, as they keep saying, is different than the way those guys are dealing with death, like yeah. junior. Um, but it still is dealing with that nonetheless. Yes. Um, that scene with Christopher where he's like ribbing on Christopher is a great scene. Yeah, it's a great scene. Because you don't, again, you kind of don't know what to expect from Christopher. And then his reaction is so yeah. crazy. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. And I feel like Artie is, you know, as he's affected by Tony's ideas and he's drawn closer and closer to them, it leads to him kind of falling apart. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like, and also like he's a more cruel person. Yeah. You know, and as he is like enticed by these propositions that Tony has and he gets closer to the mob, then he becomes like a worse person as a result. And Charmaine is somebody who actually like kind of keeps him in check. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Adriana is wearing that tiger dress. She likes tiger print, but she's wearing a dress that's just kind of a tiger. with a tiger on it. So that's interesting. Um, (laughs) What does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it is interesting. Maybe she just likes tigers. I think she likes tigers. I think she definitely likes tigers. Um, yeah, it was interesting for her. Like, I, And I could probably go way more into... We'll, we'll talk about it yeah. more in other episodes. But, you know, like, we we heard a while ago that Chris wanted her to quit her, her job, right? And so yeah. now we see kind of that she never said anything to Artie yeah. and she's been avoiding that. So anyways, just to point that out for future episodes yeah um that we'll talk about adriana and her situation at this point but do you want to talk about the dying characters do you want to talk about threes the number three threes let's i think we can talk about all of them okay i think they're all linked so the threes the threes i think are really interesting right and i think that's oh but the one thing i want sorry just one second the when i asked you about the fountains yes go back for a second 
this relates to my threes. They remind me of like baptismal fonts. Mm -hmm. They look like in the Catholic Church where you baptize babies. Interesting. So why that popped into my head was I think that these threes are really linked with death, but I think they're really linked also into these like Catholic rites, if mm -hmm. you want to have it that way. So like interesting. So there's the the uh, three of the rites that you go through in Catholicism are your baptism, mm -hmm. marriage, and death, right? Those are the time where you, there's these like wow. rites. So we see issues with kind of not really, a, not as much with baptism, I guess, or like birth, but we do see issues like with marriage and relationships and also with death. So anyways, I just wanted Very to... Very interesting, the, actually, yeah. yeah. Anyways, but of course the Trinity, right? Like kind of like Janice talks about the Holy Trinity, right? And we, we see, you know, in the church yeah. at the funeral of Uncle Febby, yeah. which is confusing that we have two characters so Elders. far named Febby. Febby. <laughs> it's a very popular name. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to name my first child Febby, I think. It might be hard for them to not be mistaken for any other <laughs> Febbies oh, yes, around I them. Know. That would be, that's, they'd have to be like Febby G. <laughs> school. Um, uh, like I said, so yeah, so we definitely have this religious symbolism to do with, with the Trinity. We also have it to do, I think, with like, I don't know, like, Three is kind of like in the middle of the afternoon. I don't know. I think um, we also have to like reference back a few episodes where Christopher is in, right. you know, a coma and actually says specifically. I mean, the reason why we have to like yeah. fixate on the number three is because he wakes up from his near death experience yeah. and says three o'clock. Yeah. And then Polly is very superstitious and is dealing with that. Right. And um, there's a lot of theorists who feel like three is actually a relevant number to the last scene of the last episode. Yep. Um, three and in bells, this. Right? Three, well, there's some other stuff too. <laughs> we'll get there. Don't worry. Just keep listening. And in, uh, you know, like 200 days, we'll be there. But um, yeah, but then in this episode too, like we had... Uh, the, three, th the three on the clock when the bacalas are both coming for dinner. Yeah, it was like just before which three o'clock. Which is a weird Strange time. time to eat. <laughs> yeah. Like that's a really, I don't know if it's lunch or dinner. I thought it was funny too, like Junior's fixation on things happening on, in threes mm -hmm. and that there are three people dying. Um, and yet different characters mm -hmm. refer to three characters as different three or, people. Or, which... that, or only two people, right? So right. Like at the end, we have Bobby saying, like, first my dad, then you. <laughs> I think right? that it's almost like breaking down how ridiculous it is because, yeah. I mean, anybody can choose three characters. Yeah. But, you know, for instance, like Janice says, mom, Febby. Mm -hmm. Uncle Junior. It's not even her uncle, too. So it's weird that she would have chosen <laughs> Uncle Febby. But anyways. That's a good point. Yeah, Carmella's you're right. It's... Uncle. And then, you know, <laughs> Junior was seeing it as, you know, inc obviously not including himself, but including um, Bobby Sr. in that list. You know, it was a different list. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you can turn anything into a th the yeah, number three. You, yeah, you could be – like, it's kind of like – Polly's superstitions too, right? Like if you if you think you're gonna see something like that, then you will. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Even could... AJ has a you know like I think like his friend's relative and you know yeah and yeah yeah. <laughs> um, and yet there is this like specter of the supernatural that yeah. happens in this show where maybe they're communicating that some of these things are a little bit superstitious and ridiculous, mm -hmm. but then they also put in these symbols and this imagery at the same time. So you have to kind of grapple with it mm -hmm. and you have to kind of question if there is something beyond and a supernatural yeah. aspect. Well, he's, he's messing with us as yeah. usual, right? As like usual. he's trying to make us see our desire to see stuff like that too. Right. And they like right out, ask you questions like to your face, right? Like at the end, it's like, do you think that's a coincidence? Right. Right? Like, <laughs> like they're, they give you that so that you recognize it in yourself. You identify with characters who are also seeing these threes everywhere, right? Like, it's yeah. very complex. Um, yeah. And I think that, like, the reference to religion is pretty pivotal mm -hmm. in this episode as well. I mean, there was, there was a few things that happened, actually. When Christopher confronts Artie, you know, Artie actually like rips off kind of like his overshirt and mm -hmm. actually like exposes a cross, which is really yeah. prominently in the shot. Obviously, Janice talking about the Holy Trinity. So, you know, referencing things to mm -hmm. its relevance with, you know, with Catholicism. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that those, those aspects are really interesting. And in fact, like 
the idea of religion too as an institution is maybe interesting because like I feel like this idea of Bobby Sr. as a godfather, like Tony chooses to bastardize that institution. Right. That kind of like semi sacred bond to actually kill Mustang Sally for convenience. Right. And at the same time, too, like Artie, like ripping off his shirt and maybe, you know, he kind of like clings to the cross, clinging to religion and principles. Like that's a pretty empty mm. clinging because what he's doing is clearly not in line with Catholic mm-hmm. beliefs in the actual morality mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. religion and spirituality of Christianity. Yeah. I. That scene with Janice, sorry, just to come back mm-hmm. to that. I think for that's a, a key scene. There was there was some key stuff in there. So she, they're sitting on, I don't know where they're sitting. That's a great they're question. They're in some weird couch area, like a very large couch. They both look very small on this couch, and they're both not small people. I, yeah. And it's in a weird spot. I don't know. You thought at first it was Livia's house, but yeah, then but we looked at it, it again, and I don't think it was. <laughs> Anyways, um, a couple things with that. Um, you mentioned, like, her list, like, Mom, Febby, and then Uncle yeah. Jew, right? But then they have they have this conversation about these old timers, right? They're talking about old timers, and they say the more hard ass their attitudes, the more they could suppress their feelings. And then it's something about they can say the most horrible shit in the face of tragedy, at like kind of like they're saying to God, "You don't fool me," yeah. right? Um, I think that's a really interesting characteristic, and I don't even I, I can't even quite figure out what it means in the context of this show, but. It it says something about, I think, like, what Janice values, right? And I think, like, what t- like what Livia has passed on to both Janice and Tony, yeah. at least. Maybe Barbara. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but there's this, like, way of dealing with sad things. There's this way of dealing with tragedy that I don't think is that functional for them. It doesn't allow them to grieve or to, like really experience their feelings all that well. It kind of requires them to be these like hard assed people who like say inappropriate shit in the yeah. face of tragedy. And we see that. We we see that with a lot of characters. We see that with Ralphie being insanely oh, insensitive at Ralphie the hospital. Is so insane. Even Vito, you know, and the others like eating, eating the chocolates. chocolates. <laughs> yeah. We see that with Junior and Bobby like when Junior's like yelling at Bobby and his yeah. dad's just died, right? Yeah. Like being so insensitive. Um, so I thought that was interesting. The other thing that I don't know what to do with is how does she know or like what makes her, what prompts her to ask about pussy? She's well, like, what happened? Like out of nowhere, she's like, what happened? To because Sal? I think that these characters are dealing with death. Mm-hmm. And I think Janice recognizes that he died. And I think that that's actually a really key scene that happens mm-hmm. there. So they're talking of God. You know, they're talking about Junior now, mm-hmm. who's somebody who's very close to them, and they share a lot of history mm-hmm. with dealing with cancer and potentially death. They're forced to confront the afterlife, which is something that these characters almost never do, mm-hmm. but is clearly, like, hanging over them mm-hmm. as people mm-hmm. and hanging over their psychology and infiltrating their subconscious. And we get to see that through watching this show. But when she says what happened to Sal, it's interesting, because before that, she said... You know, do you think there's a coincidence about the threes? And she's talking of God. Like, yeah. they're directly confronting death. And Tony kind of, like, gets up. Like, he's uncomfortable. Yeah, he's kind of, he like, escaping. He about religion. When she says what happened to Sal, something happens. And that's that the camera angles completely change to looking down on Tony. And that goes back to what I think we were talking about in the very beginning of the show, in the first season. You know, this idea of there is a power above Tony. Even though he's largely in control mm. of his environment. But that doesn't appeal to Tony to have someone no, above him. No, but as viewers, we now yeah. are looking down on Tony because the afterlife is powerful over him. Mm-hmm. You know, Sal dying, he's now in the afterlife. Like, he would be looking down, mm. theoretically. Yeah, <laughs> but, if you believe in that, sure. <laughs> but, you know, I think, like, the eternal and nature and all the things that this show establishes as a really important, re- you know, reflection of the eternal, the mm-hmm. afterlife, death. Well, and the inevitability of it. The in, right? And the inevitability of it, that is more powerful than Tony. And now Tony is a weak character, which in all reality in, in his world, he's not. Even the last scene that we have, which I think is fascinating, they have the opposite camera angle. And they're mm-hmm. both to very extreme degrees. When he's standing amongst the statues mm-hmm. and Wilmore walks away from him, yeah. we have 
almost like the lowest possible shot looking yeah. up at him, which we talked about the statues around him, you know, being immovable objects, mm-hmm. being firm, being unbendable to Will. And maybe, you know, Wilmore has something that we should respect in a character to have a moral backbone. But Tony's still a very powerful presence. And when we see him in the end in the physical world, yeah. you know, we're looking up at him and we're left with this dominating force who can ruin the lives of others. Yeah. And even if he's surrounded by things that do not move, he still has the power to fuck with everybody around him. Yeah. But the reality is that there is a higher power that's constantly looking yeah. down on him and he can't cope with it. No. And that's the thing, like, and we cause we see him, it's almost, like, comical the way he tries to get out of that parking ticket, right? Like, it, it shows you, like, what lengths he'll go to to not have someone be more powerful than him or to show someone else how powerful he is. But he doesn't have that control over death. Yeah. Right? And so when he finds out about right. Junior, right, like, that hits him quite close to home. Like, he... He actually like doesn't know what to do with that, right? He says he's not gonna tell anyone. He has to call Janice, right, and like lean on her for support. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have that, like, so he, you know, he does everything he can to get out of this ticket, but he doesn't have that trick with death. No, and he never will. You know, and he can't, and so that's very or ducks. He can't control <laughs> he can't, the ducks. He can't keep either. the ducks there. No, he can't. <laughs> Um, so I, yeah, I think, I don't know. I just think that there's, like I, like I said in the beginning, like characters kind of come to some, we, we understand big things about these characters that we maybe have only had little hints into before, but I think they, they really clarified some of these messages in this episode. Yeah. I think, you know, um, yeah. Junior saying too, like, um, talking about if you're saying, don't tell anybody, which yeah. then Tony immediately does by calling Janice, yeah. but saying like, if you're sick, they think of you as a non-entity. Yeah. And that idea of the nothing or yeah. non-entity is a key part of this show. Yeah. So like that association between sickness and disease and being a nothing yeah. is a big issue for these characters. And Junior can't accept that and doesn't want others to think of him already as yeah. disappeared. Well, I think it's tied in too with like, because one of the other questions that I wrote down was like, why would Tony get Bobby Sr. to carry out this hit? Well, like, I mean, I think we see Mustang Sally like he's street smart. You know, yeah. he's laying low. It would be difficult to track him down, and they have an opportunity through Bobby Sr. Yeah. Bobby Sr. is willing to yeah. do this. He, you know, has established himself within the family. He's clearly capable of it. Yeah. I think it actually is just like a convenient okay thing to do well it's interesting like then the debate that kind of ensues right surrounding like you know bobby jr like well bob our bobby bacala right bobby jr and junior soprano and tony regarding like you know letting slash asking bobby senior to do this hit because i think like there is this part of everyone else like well of bobby bacala for example who doesn't who, who thinks his dad is too old or too close to death to be doing that, right? Yeah. And Tony says these things like, ah, it'll give him something to live for. Right. Right? Um, so we kind of see how different characters treat that differently. Junior at first feels like, you know what, like, get, you know, maybe Bobby's right. Like, let me ask Tony and see if I can get him out of doing it. But then changes his mind, right? Because his own grappling with him becoming closer and closer to death is happening right yeah. so like he's trying to get have for himself something to live for too i don't know um yeah 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 i think i think that there's a lot i mean also this idea of uh, for me okay it also links to something interesting junior getting cancer of the stomach mm. and everybody constantly talking about food. another toothpick like mm. There's something about stature in the show mm. and like being large mm-hmm. that is like the ideal and this idea of being small and low weight. Like there's a lot of statements like Febby when he died was 94 pounds. Yeah. Janice cannot stop talking about another toothpick. She says it right after we hear that in the yeah. first scene. In her scene with Tony, she just keeps on repeating it. Well, and we hear that it comes from Livia saying it about her own brother. Right. And the thing about this is that I think that there's – Another example of people acting in insensitive ways after the death of somebody or the potential death, Mm. somebody's sickness, Mm. you know, we have like so little respect for somebody else. And even Tony kind of recognized that. He says to Janice, have a little respect. And yet Tony then laughs. 
right. about another toothpick, right? Yeah. There's something like deplorable about being small. Right. I think, and that's really interesting. Right. That like, and These that made people me think who, of that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, no. It's just that like people who overconsume are the ideal, and that yeah. like not having that is like you're you're dying or something. It it like reminds mm-hmm. you of being a non-entity. Mm-hmm. No, I think like that's what I when I saw that ending shot with Tony standing like yeah. really largely amongst those statues. Like that was kind of my thing. Like it stood out to me. Like he he's not another toothpick. Definitely not. You know, um, it's even like, even like Bobby Bacala, like Bobby Jr. Bacala, like his fat seems to be enhanced in this episode too. Like he just comes across <laughs> as so big. Um, well, he's wearing a fat suit still he, in well, this, I know, at this point of the show. I know. So that's, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's so, it's like really, really interesting. And I think Tony, like Tony really struggles with death. Definitely. You know, and I mean, all the characters do. Junior's struggle is is really interesting. I think you're right. Like the cancer of the stomach thing is really yeah. It's like eating away at his yeah. stature, but it's know? also like eating his, away at the thing that his... consumes. Right? Like we right. we tie together food with all sorts of things in this epi- in this show. Yeah. Right? Like they use food, you know, with violence. Yeah. They use food with religion quite yeah. a bit. Right? Like so, there is this like consumption imagery that we have going on but he's being consumed by the thing that consumes yeah um and Hmm. so it's kind of this like overwhelming um you know i don't think junior would ever question like you know what he's done with his life or whatever yeah but he's definitely questioning how he's going to encounter death yeah um and how kind of he got there how he got to the place that he got to yeah you know um yeah we don't see too much food in this episode, mind you. We right. just see some orange juice at a key time. There is some orange juice at the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, that idea of Tony being consumed by death, I think, is really interesting, too. Like, it was remi- it was making me think about that concept of, like, well, just, like, being confronted by death and actually, like, dealing with it and thinking about it. Um, you know, when Bobby Sr. goes into the scene where he kills Mustang Sally, he mm-hmm. tells the younger guy you know, you should cut out that habit. That's a filthy habit. And he says, I'm going to die from something, which obviously has the obvious irony that he dies about two seconds later from being shot. But, you know, this, I, this idea that I'm going to die from something like his, like that character, not like dealing with death and not thinking about it and just kind of like doing what's easy in the moment. And Bobby senior is a character who's at the end of his life now has to confront the realities of his choices of his actions. Yeah. And, um, you know, as a smoker, it's fascinating, you know, like after he commits this murder, (laughs) he he chooses to still engage in the thing that makes him feel better. That's a creepy scene. That's a pretty intense scene. Um, he's covered in blood <laughs> and then just like yeah. smoking in his car with that, whatever that song is that's playing. Oh yeah. Something by like America or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It was very like Americana rock. Like it was, yeah. um, yeah. 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 I mean also like that time to what Carmelo was saying in the beginning of the episode in the therapy session, you know, about, you know, he's like the person who smoked his whole life gets mm. his come up and, um, Sorry, he doesn't get his comeuppance. Smoked his whole life and then sues the cigarette company. <laughs> I was mixing up my notes yeah. <laughs> all over the place. Oh, my gosh. But, um, you know, I actually don't think that Bobby is somebody like that. I think that mm-hmm. in this part of his life, he actually has accepted that he's about to die. Mm-hmm. And that's a rare position that we don't typically well, he doesn't, see he's in He's not show. taking the chemo, right? Junior's all upset with him. Yeah. Right? He's, like, offering him, like, I want you to go see this doctor. He's like, are you doing the chemo? He's like... the treatment's worse than the disease right like yeah he's making choices about how he's going to encounter death yeah you know he is which is which bothers re- junior junior's very angry well and also you know he's like one of these old timers yeah. you know who doesn't deal with death in that way kind yeah. of the way that janice they, talks they about say, it say you don't fool me yeah and right. they say inappropriate shit yeah yeah so yeah for me it was interesting like that young guy who was with mustang sally like him not dealing with the realities of death and his choices and what they will lead towards because it's it's convenient it's easy and that's what people always do in this show yeah. and bobby senior is this rare character who we only need this one time yeah and then you know 
it's be and it's because of that. It's because yeah. he's near the end of his life. He's near death. Yeah. That he's a different person in this realm. Yeah. In Soprano's world, he represents like a different ability to actually cope with these questions that the show is constantly mm-hmm. putting in front of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, during that scene, actually, too, it's interesting. Like they they have between Bobby Senior and Mustang Sally, they're using these POV shots. We have a couple of them. Which is fascinating, actually, because the first time we referenced a POV shot, I think, was in House Arrest, which was also written by Terrence Winter. I think and he likes them. I think he likes them. And also, that's a, a key thing in the last scene of the show. Mm. So they are establishing something there. But we have, like, Bobby Sr. And um, <laughs> Bobby Sr. is actually, like, sitting in front of a plant and a portrait of trees in a path. So if you've been listening to the show, I mean, there's a lot of relationship between nature and and death and you know these things that we're talking about right now but um it shows bobby and then we see mustang sally from the perspective of bobby and um well i guess actually we're kind of getting like both of their perspectives at different times you know we also get mustang sally's perspective maybe is it when characters are close to dying (laughs) i don't know (laughs) (laughs) who knows but you know they, they do these shots where they establish a character, where they are, where they're looking. And what they could see. And what they could see. And then we get a shot that is exactly where that character is. And now we're seeing what that character is mm-hmm. seeing. Mm-hmm. So. We get it later too with Junior though. When Junior is watching TV, he makes mm-hmm. himself a sandwich, he sits down. Bobby comes to pick him up for the funeral. His yeah. own dad's funeral. Yeah. Um, he comes to pick up Junior. Um, we also get that POV from Junior's perspective trying to watch the TV. Right. That's right. Um, yeah. Bobby's like in the way. Yeah. Blocking him somehow. And I think that when we see things through characters' eyes, I think it kind of gives us some kind of insight. Like it's it's really highlighting something about their psyche, right? So um, we're able to, you know, see through their eyes basically. So in terms of when uh, Mustang Sal and, and Bobby Bacala Sr. are there, right? Like we, they both have different impressions of themselves at first, Sal is like they're waiting for Bobby Bacala Sr. to come, right? right? They know that there's a hit out on Mustang Sal, right? Right? Or they they must assume that there's a hit out on Mustang Sal, right? Right. So he has his gun. He's ready to yeah. kill him. But then he, you know, he's coughing. He's this old man, right? So his perspective on oh, him. Oh, you really think changed. Mustang Sal was ready to kill Bob? Yeah, this- no, I no, do. I don't actually. I think that he was protecting himself and was ready for somebody to come but then he says is it the old man right, he's right, looking right, right, for right. the old man yeah, yeah, and then yeah. when he comes up i mean it's his godfather he right. reached out to that's him right. to protect him yeah so okay never mind he actually i mean that's what disarms him and yeah. that's why i think that tony wanted you right know, well well also, Bobby Sr. but even apart from that like, like like old people are kind of disarming in this show right like right um and so i think that's why the pov shot so i was you know, I was off in the beginning, but the POV shot does work because you kind of see, like, from um, Sal's perspective, right? It's kind of this, like, looking down shot. Like, you just see from his standing position, you see him sitting over there. Mm-hmm. Um, and you underneath the counter, right? You kind of have this, like, countertop that's yeah. cutting his viewpoint. Um, underneath there, there is this, like, thing that's threatening, but he can't see it, right? Mm-hmm. It's out of his view. Um and then when we see things from Bobby Sr.'s viewpoint, he, you know, he's like, wa- he's watching these very, like, minute things that Sal's doing. Like, we see this close-up of his hand letting the water run, yeah. for example. So, I don't, yeah, I don't know. There's something, there's something about it there, kind of this, like, old-timer mentality, um, like how they see the world is somehow different or like the things they mm. choose to focus on. And then with Junior, he's trying to watch this movie. I don't know what movie that is. Yeah, I, I wish I had known. He's like, his. we can see from his point of view that he's like desperate to see what's going on in this yeah. movie, right? Because we see him trying to, you know, see through Bobby Bacala, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. And it is this kind of old timey movie. That's, that's as far as I can kind of get with that. But... You know, I, I think there's I don't email know. us if you know the movie we want to know we really would like to know I and mean, we <laughs> couldn't find that anywhere yeah um yeah but that's you know, those are like the basics of what i've got today yeah a few things i mean i mean 
from that scene, the the painting behind Bobby scene are also yeah. they're for me. No, these are just kind of like random things and yeah. scenes, but you know, with Bobby crying about his dad earlier on in the episode, there's yeah. like a paint. He, I feel like he's a very different kind of character and has a unique sensibility in yeah. this world. Like he's a much more sensitive person. He's tasked with these more like kind of like feminine feminized jobs oh, yeah, even totally. like he's he's like a nurse to junior yeah. and that kind of establishes him as outside the norm <laughs> within the soprano family but to see him like in touch with his emotions is interesting mm-hmm. crying about his dad in front of junior and you know kind of like showing that quote unquote weakness or whatever mm-hmm. and there's also a painting behind him of flowers mm-hmm. in that moment which i thought was interesting as something to kind of represent how he is different from the people around him mm-hmm. um the last scene that i i did want to talk about was um very near the end where you talked about oj for a second where tony takes out orange juice which i don't think is the key part of this scene but no Me- i do meadow think meadow is also singing that song breathless mm, breathless <laughs> from the early 2000s right well this is where she takes the lamp so you know disarming the fbi for that you know that threat against tony but for me, that was a really interesting character for deepening Carmela. Mm-hmm. And, yes, um, kind of similarly to the scene with the traffic cop earlier where yeah. we see her say um, some black kid from the neighborhood. She's, well, yeah, I mean, in that scene, I, I yeah, Carmela says, like, yeah, like some black guy from the neighborhood stole your, stole bike. your bike, which is, for me, really interesting. And this enters into this, like, racial kind of domain of the show and, and the aspects of, like, these characters and how they deal with race because Carmela is smart enough to know that with the whole Noah Tannenbaum incident and how Tony responded and how Meadow responded that clearly (laughs) that is uh, putting that information out there that Meadow clearly would not have shared um, is like stirring the pot Mm -hmm. and clearly about to make Tony respond in a way Mm -hmm. that's going to not be sensitive inflame things and there's there's a degree of it that like i mean even like the fact that she would even say that is is like indicative of who she is as a person yeah i know it was so interesting (laughs) because it's not really like a relevant piece of information to this at all that's really fucked up yeah but um and then she's kind of like who me afterwards right like she's mad at tony right taking it further Right, like right, and clearly she's aware of what she's doing yeah. there. I mean, there's no way that she's not smart enough yeah. to to know that. Um, and you know, even we we do get a window into the kind of like complicated, backwards kind of like old more more kind of like old timey concepts towards race that she has in the episode where she goes to New York and she's talking to Meadow and she's definitely not like the champion of justice that we would have no, expected. That we she's almost want her to be. She's almost like protecting Tony's, you know, viewpoints from where he comes from and Yeah. 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 Which which we do like we excuse old timey people for that kind of stuff all the time, right? Like my poppy was would say racist things, right? And like you, <laughs> as when many you, poppies do, as poppies do, <laughs> and you like you allow space for it, right? Like kind of like Janice was saying, like they say these like messed up things in the face of tragedy. Like it's kind of similar. Like we, you give people space to do those things if they're if you think they're like otherwise good people, right? You you can like excuse them. And yet there is like a responsibility totally. to <laughs> engage no, and, and educate people and, and no, hopefully exactly. yeah, like, and I think that's what this show captures, right? Yeah. It's like whose responsibility is that and you know, what does it do when you defend somebody like that, yeah. right? And like Well and what's really fascinating slope. here is that actually like Meadow actually talks about it in a way that is you know, kind of like more in much more she informed, calls him a obviously. Yeah, well, when he before talks that, she's stereos. talking about you know she's like that's so ridiculous. It's more you know it's about economic yeah. status. That was a good. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we don't need to get into the like overall you know discussions about these, but like Meadow is is you know like talking about something that is um you know much more informed about the mm-hmm. issues than this just kind of like basic overt racism mm-hmm. that Tony has that just kind of like simplifies and like blames a race 
you know, for for mm -hmm. problems. Me and and Meadow is you know correct that like if you actually look into these issues that like SES and you know like yeah. Ec, you know yeah that these although things... you, you get the feeling that Meadow like just heard this in class yesterday or something right there there <laughs> like she just she just got wise to it because she grew up in this family where that was kind of. You know, not the norm. Just perhaps, talk about but I think like that, that there is something in that scene. You know, like then after Tony responds, like, "Oh, you know, like you can tell me all this stuff after they take your car stereo," yeah. and then she says, "You're, You're such hypocrite, a hypocrite." Yeah. And I think that that's an important position, and that we witness a moment where, like, Tony is called out for his bullshit on multiple fronts, yeah. right there. Yeah. You know, for his like overt, basic racism. Yeah. His insane hypocrisy. hypocrisy. You know that. He is, you know, clearly, I mean, like, responsible for the theft of people's goods more than anybody else. Even in an earlier episode, episode where there is, like, a scene of that family in New York who's robbed. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, that guy's, like, yelling the N-word after them. Yeah. And then, you know, like, who would, or, like, you know, like, who would do this? And then we, you know, there's that very, like, over-the-top cut to Tony's face. Yeah. But... Tony manipulates others to do his bidding. Like, he's actually the one who's in control and, like, perpetrating these evils on the world. Mm -hmm. And he's actually manipulating the, the like, the position that some that are, like, less fortunate and, and have less, like, a, that are... Yeah, that, like, that, you know, um, who have less, like, social capital. Right, or like, yes, like exactly. Or, like, less of these, like, manipulative strategies or something yeah. like that, like... And people who do find themselves... Like, like a Zellman, like a yeah. assemblyman Zellman to do their bidding. Yeah, and the crazy thing about Tony is that he's manipulating people within a lower socioeconomic status, and then he's still blaming them at the end of the day mm -hmm. for yeah. all these perpetrations, even though he's the one who... Like creating them, almost. He's the one who's creating them. Yeah. So the hypocrisy is insane. And yeah. at least there's somebody like Meadow who does call him out, even though he's not listening, we can. Mm -hmm. You know, and somebody actually on the show, they don't always confront these issues and say something that's like truthful or gets to more to the bottom of the issue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just presented to us and we need to figure it out. Yeah, but, but here they kind of help us. To... Sometimes we get a character who actually kind of says something that's, you know, yeah. gets to the heart of these matters. Yeah. Anyway, we're over an hour now. We don't normally do oh, that. Gosh. So okay. Um, okay. Well. Wow. It was a great episode. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah, Artie got a great earring. Artie looks great with his earring. Yeah. We love it. Um, Good job, Artie. You're very cool now. So cool. So cool. Um, yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I guess that sums it up. Next episode's incredible. Yeah, and... that one might be over an hour, too. Yeah. Well, season three is really good, so we hope you've been enjoying. Yeah. If you enjoy, rate and review. We appreciate oh, it. Oh, yes. Rate or review. Yeah. And we will catch you very soon. Bye.